this year, but people call me Tess. Um, I have been in the industry for two years now, and I work in consulting, specifically data analytics, stroke science consulting. And I'll be taking you through, you know, applications of data science and to help us appreciate everything beyond the technical, you know, beyond the technical bit of things, yeah, to have a wider view of exactly how this can be applied and the methodologies that are normally followed when we're applying data science in real life, yeah. So I hope um, you're ready to learn and I also hope to learn a few things from you know your questions or your comments so as we begin the session um, I would like us to just post in the chat with our um, level of understanding of data science and machine learning you know you might be a beginner an enthusiast someone who's interested an expert or you know intermediate so just post with your you know level within the chat for us to, you know, gauge um, how our audience looks like. So without wasting much time, I'll be sharing my screen. And uh, let me know when you see my screen. I think I'll present, yeah. So someone to unmute themselves because I have my presentation of, on full screen. So, to and tell me whether they can see my screen. Uh, yes, we can see your screen. All right. Um, so, in case of any questions or clarifications, just feel free to unmute yourself and ask and interrupt me. This will be a very interactive session. So, we are going to be understanding data science applications, as I had said earlier. And our agenda for today, it's not much, but um, I hope we'll get to learn something. So our agenda for today is to understand, you know, what is data science um, and how is data science important to businesses, yeah? The other thing is to understand how data scientists approach data science problems, yeah? The other thing is the different use cases. And I'll also share with you a couple of resources where you can, you know, get data sets to implement this in real life. Yeah, so I really do not want to waste a lot of time, but before I even move to my next slide, maybe someone just hazard a guess. What do you think data science is? So let me pick someone. Um, um, hmm. do I ask? David Mongi, what, what is your definition of data science? Or really just anyone they can unmute themselves and tell us what they think data science is hi everyone um so i guess to me it's a way of getting value from data people have stored addressed maybe in a relational database or any kind of database really um so just making sense of raw data okay great yeah, that's that's correct. Um, exactly. So data science is basically the science of making sense or drilling sense out of big data. Different people have different definitions of what data science is. Um, simply learn defines it as, as dealing with vast volumes of data using modern tools and techniques. So we know, you know, in the past years, in the recent years or the past decade, there has been a lot of data being generated because of the growing technologies, the different sources of um, data that we have. We have mobile phones, IoT devices, literally everything is going smart. And that means a lot of data is being generated every single day. And that brings in the essence of data science. So we need, the data is too huge for us to be able to make sense out of it from the traditional way of doing things. So that's why we need to employ modern tools and techniques to do that. But remember, after all is said and done, the end goal of this is for business decisions, yeah? Making business decisions. That is when you're looking at data from a commercial perspective. And as you might have all known, uh, data science is not a single discipline you know, field, yeah? There are different things that are involved. You have 
computer science knowledge, statistics, mathematics, domain knowledge. So it's a combination of different sort of skill sets. And that is why data science is a field where it literally anyone can be in. It doesn't matter what, you know, what your background is. As long as you're interested in learning, data science is a field where anyone can just be in. Okay, so how is data science important to businesses? Yeah, so I am leaning more to the business side because, you know, out here we focus on, uh, you know, when you're alone or when you have not experienced data from an industry perspective, you really don't see the, you know, the, the bigger picture of, you know, what's the point of all this, yeah? So one key importance of data science in businesses is to empower decision making. Yeah, so you have huge amounts of data, you do a, a bit of analysis here and there, predict a few things, and with that you're able to see, I can, you know, I will invest in this um, as opposed to this. Um, the other thing is improved products, um, that is innovation. So if you're, you know, maybe for example, Facebook, Google, they have so many products, but how do they know, you know, what product to focus on? They look at how customers are behaving, um, you know, what products are selling more than the others, what feedback are they getting from the different interaction with the different products. And with that, you're able to innovate, yeah? Something like TikTok, looking five years ago, you know, maybe no one had ever thought of such an idea, but, you know, maybe they collected a lot of data and observed patterns of how people are behaving within the social media. And they're able to create a product that, you know, nobody could have thought that it, it could sell, you know, that widely and that fast. Um, another importance of data science is reduction in costs. So when you look at the predictive side of data or, you know, the automated side of data, you're able to reduce costs by replacing. So when it comes to now the advanced AI, by replacing what, you know, people, maybe you've employed 50 people to do something, but when you automate or replace that with artificial intelligence, you get that, um, something is being done faster with less resources and that's a reduction in costs and um, a reduction in costs uh, might mean higher profits because definitely when you reduce costs you have improved products good decision making um, you have achieved your goal as a business which is profit making yeah so those are the different um, you know importances of data science in businesses and i mean the list is this list is not exhaustive, there are too many applications and importances of data science within businesses. So before we even go to, you know, before we even go to the actual use cases, yeah, you know, you can just go somewhere on the internet and find the different use cases, but how exactly do data scientists approach problems? What's the ideal business way of approaching data science problems, yeah? Because, you know, you might think, you know, just have a data set and you have thought of an idea and you just want to implement it. Yeah, Data science in the real world is not just an idea that someone thought about and they just want to, you know, run with it. There are steps that are followed. Yeah, this is not, a, you know, the template or the or of what is supposed to be followed but i would like us to go through it it is an ideal way of approaching data science problems yeah so remember every data problem is a business problem yeah so we're talking about how can this business improve how can we do better as a business so we really need to start you know from a problem identification stage yeah so i'll go through this diagram and just pick in on it and we will debrief and in case you have any question on it um feel free to to shoot yeah so this is the start down here and the very first stage is to identify a problem so you're running a business uh let's use uh maybe a bank or an e-commerce business today and uh, we have identified a problem so how do you go about even identify the problem so maybe there is a flow in a process customers are leaving, for example, people are not using certain products that you have, for example, in a bank, you have different loan products, but people are shying away from, you know, 
certain products. So really the problem identification is a process on its own that involves a lot of, you know, talking, brainstorming with people within the business, the tech people, literally everyone, even the different stakeholders on a root cause analysis of what exactly is the problem and, uh, you know, what is causing this problem. So once you have understood the problem and you have, you know, you have a very clear problem statement that this is a problem you have, we are losing customers and, you know, maybe you don't know why, you need to know why or you need to get more data to understand why you're losing customers. So the next thing is business understanding, yeah? So you have already identified a problem, yeah? But you need to understand your business. What are our goals? What are our KPIs? What are our, you know, metrics? What metrics are we tracking, yeah? So an instance, you can identify a problem in maybe um, a bank. Certain products are not being used. But when you go to the business understanding, probably, you know, someone will tell you, um, our strategy, our five-year strategy, we really can't accommodate this. This will take a lot of, um, you know, resources because, you know, data science is a cost center. It will take a lot of resources, so we can't do that for now. Or, you know, someone just tell you, this is just off our budget. We can't do this here. So we need to have a business understanding and understanding of the problem from a business perspective. Does this make sense to us as it's now? Um, you know, is this really going to bring us profits? You know, when you pitch your idea to your bosses and those C-suit guys, they really want to speak in terms of money. How is this helping us? How is this helping our business? What problem, you know, how will this problem help us here? Yeah? So really need to have a good business understanding. And this, these two processes, you know, go hand in hand because you need to talk to people a lot, the people who use these products, the people who use the systems, you know, yeah. So the next stage is the data acquisition. So uh, if you have noted, we haven't talked about acquiring the data at any point, yeah. So the first two steps might even take months, yeah. So the next step, you have already done problem identification, you have understood the business, and you have realized, oh, this is a data problem. We need to get data to do this. Yeah, we need to get data to analyze and see what we can come up with. So the third stage is data acquisition. And this is where you look into the data that is already existing. Yeah, so uh, in real life, most companies, they don't have maybe clean data, good data. The real, their data is just everywhere. And I'm speaking for most companies I've seen in Kenya and outside Kenya as well. You know, they have data everywhere, data in silos, or, you know, different systems have the same data, but it has different information. So this is a very critical stage. And this is where, in a big organization, this is where data engineers come in, yeah? the guys that help to create the data pipeline, where, you know, um, as Mwangi had mentioned, um, that data warehouse, a place where everyone else who needs the data can get it in a very clean format and as a single source of truth, yeah? So as a data engineer, you come in here, yeah? So maybe the person who is doing the problem identification and understanding is a business analyst, yeah? But then they're like, oh, we need data. So we talk to the data engineer. So the data engineers, the SQL analysts are the ones who come here. They do the, the pipelining. So this is where technologies like Hadoop come in, Hive. So those different technologies come in here, the data acquisition stroke ETL, yeah? So maybe you've gotten the data from the internet, from the different databases from the different transactional databases, you want to put it in a data warehouse or a data lake for it to be accessed easily. So that is where all that comes in there. So um, the next stage is, um, so I'll branch down, um, I'll go to uh, understanding the data. So you have collected all your data from the different sources, you have cleaned your data and you have your data in a good format, but you need to understand the data, which is EDA exploratory data analysis. So this is a mandatory step in data, whether you're doing data analysis, data science. So this is where you look at the distribution of the data, you know, the different features of the data. And so at this point, you can go into directions. 
So we have feature engineering and data visualization. So um, once you have understood your data and then you realize, oh, actually we don't need to do predictive analytics on this data. We can just visualize it as it is. So this is what we call descriptive statistics, you know, explaining what happened. So describing what happened. So you can just go to visualization, visualize your data and the end, you know, the end, anything data related, you can't present it in a technical format to people. You need to present it in a dashboard report and score in business terms, basically. In you need to present your data in business terms. So you do your understanding, the visualization, and that's it. You build a dashboard and report and report to management or whoever it is that you're reporting to. So that is one, you know of doing it and this is an, a back and forth process as you can see it is a iterative process because maybe you have not visualized something well you need to go back and understand the data once more yeah so it's not a one-time process you do it many times yeah so maybe you have done your EDA and you're like oh this is a you know predictive problem I need to be able to do you know machine learning put my data in a model and that and yeah so the next stage is feature engineering so feature engineering is a technical term in machine learning that you know in layman's terms means selecting the most important features in your data that will you know that in will influence your outcome yeah for example um this data from idea you have 171 columns but really maybe you're doing let me give an example with fraud, um, a name, you know, or a, maybe a date is important, but there are some things that don't, don't really influence the outcome of anything. So let me look for a good example. So maybe it's a um, customer who purchased and you have, you know, data of previous purchases of all customers. Yeah. So maybe you just need to see maybe how long they stay in a website, what they do, so the name is not important here. Yeah? So something like your name, you drop that feature, you update features. So feature engineering also requires a lot of domain knowledge, yeah? Because feature engineering in healthcare and feature engineering in marketing might not be the same, yeah? They're different domains. So you need domain knowledge as a data scientist to be able to understand that. And if you don't have that domain knowledge, you need to sit with people who actually have that technical knowledge of that area and understand what features are really important to the outcome of our machine learning model. So after you've identified your features, you have dropped the features that you don't need. Now you go into the um, model creation, training and validation. So this is where you first of all select the model that you're going to use. So what model are you going to use? There are different, you know, machine learning models um, around. So with your data, after you've understood your features and the different types of the features, how which model are you going to choose? Yeah. So remember, every time you're doing all these stages, you need to have your business understanding or your metrics at the back of your mind. What exactly do I want to achieve um, in business terms? Yeah. So don't get too much buried into the technical things and forget to answer, you know, to keep referring to your business question in the first place. So after you select your model, um, this will be dependent on, you know, a lot of factors. What, what data you have, what, what capacity do you have to train your model? Yeah. So this is the process of training, validating your data, and it's an iterative process. If you have done even a toy machine learning project before, you know, you change features here and there, you change things around, yeah. So it's a very, it's a very iterative process, yeah. So in an ideal world, you have trained your model, you're satisfied that my model is okay, my data is well distributed, so the next stage is to, you have to deploy, you, even if you build a software, you have to deploy it to cloud or to production, yeah, wherever you want to deploy it. So this is the model deployment. So here comes another concept called ML Ops, machine learning ops. So this is post creation. So this is just maintaining your model in production. So 
there are different things that you do. You have, um, after you have um, deployed your model into production, we have data drift analysis. This is where, uh, so we are assuming that this is a pipeline where the data comes in cleaned and then, you know, it's just loaded into the model. So you might find that the data coming in is not well distributed. So you need to keep checking for the distribution of the incoming data into the model. Yeah, so the other thing is model monitoring. Model monitoring is just looking at how your model is performing. Now the model itself in production, uh, is the model still accurate given you know the same set of data? Is the model accuracy changing? So with that, you need to, you know, come check, check the logs and, you know, iterate this process over and over, yeah? So then at the end of the day, we do dashboards, reports, and scores, yeah? So at the end of the day, after everything is said and done, your end result will be um, dashboard, reports, and scores, yeah? So in a, in, a, in a small company, you might find yourself doing everything here, but in a big organization, you might find a business analyst collecting the requirements, a data engineer, doing their data acquisition, a data scientist, you know, training the model and maybe, you know, in deploying the model into production and maybe a software engineer maintaining the model, yeah? So different, different organizations have different um, roles for the different stages here. Yeah, so at this point, I would like to ask, is there any question on this approach? Okay, so there's no question. Okay, so actually, if you are, you know, to forget everything, just, you know, have an appreciation of this data science um, life cycle, and it will help you, you know, if when, when you're doing those um, competitions on your own, your own learning, you need to think like you're working for a business, yeah? So um, the next, um, sorry. The next um, step is to now look at the different data science applications. Yeah. So when you do a, just a Google search, data science application, literally learning data science, you know, data science or analytics is like knowing English. Yeah. You write math in English, science, physics, anything you do, you write it in English. And that's the whole point of data science. So every industry, every sector, every department is generating a lot of data. And that means data science can be applied literally anywhere, you know, everywhere that data is being produced, you know, healthcare, transport, supply chain, manufacturing, banking, I, literally cybersecurity. And so therefore, you know, it's not practical to have all the, the things here, but this was just to help us appreciate um, the different data science applications. So we will narrow down to a few, a few use cases, of course, and then I'll share with you um, a couple of links to data sets and um, competitions or different ways you can apply or learn to use data science. So brief, uh, briefly, let us go through this. So the first the first one here is e-commerce. So e-commerce is like Amazon, um, Jumia, for those who know Jumia, or eBay, yeah. So they're the different e-commerce sites. Uh, so this image is, I've attributed my source. I'm not a plagiarist. So, um, so let's start with identifying consumers. So as an e-commerce, uh, you don't have a physical store really like your consumers come to your physical store to get your your stuff so you literally do everything online uh so how do you identify consumers so given you can get historical data from all the consumers that have been there you can do market surveys on the different needs of the consumers and therefore so once you identify consumers the, the point of identifying consumers is one tailor products to what they need or might want um and also, you know, get the different categories of your consumers and do maybe something like customer segmentation. You know, you sell this product to this, this group of people at a certain price and 
they are, they are like that. So the other thing is recommending products. So I know if you've gone to maybe Amazon, maybe you've selected, you want to buy a certain item and then down there, there's a statement. Some, the people who bought this also bought this. So basically that's a recommender system in production. So it's telling you someone, you know, it has observed trends that people who buy this tend to buy that thing in two other items. So they just nudge you. So the point is just nudging you to buy, um, you know, their products. And then analyzing reviews, maybe you leave reviews on your e-commerce platform and they need to get to incorporate that feedback in, you know, improving their products and services. Um, the other thing, the other application is healthcare. So healthcare is, you know, big on data. A lot of data is collected. A lot of, you know, machines are being used and, you know, in an ideal world, you would have a record of all your hospital visits. And every time you go to a new hospital, the doctor has a whole history of your, you know, uh, of your medical records. Therefore, we might reduce the cases of misdiagnosis here and there. Yeah, so data is being used in medical image analysis, drug discovery during research, bioinformatics, and virtual assistance. So this is, you know, healthcare is a very key industry within our you know we are all healthy being healthy is something good yeah so there are very many use cases of data in healthcare the other one is transport um we might have heard of you know self-driving cars car monitoring systems enhancing safety for passengers enhanced driving experience and i don't know whether i should mention this on transport or banking but You've heard of cases, there are cases where insurance companies are actually leveraging on data. Now, this may be the car monitoring system data to know what premiums to charge people, yeah? So if you have had five accidents in the past eight months, why should you, and another person has not had an accident in the past five years, why should you pay the same premium, yeah? And therefore, so therefore they know how to, you know, you pay your premiums based on your past driving behavior. So that is a use case of data. Yeah. So um, the other thing is finance. Finance is a key user of data because even in e-commerce, they have a, a they have a finance bit in their business. Healthcare, they have a finance bit. Literally every business I tell has a finance aspect to it. So in finance, we can have customer segmentation and I'll give an example of a bank where bank, banks have different products. Maybe they have different deposit products, different loan products, but maybe they charge different interest rates. So they need to have an understanding of the different categories of their customers for them to know what to charge what customers and get good returns. Um, the other is strategic decision making. This is basically the C-suit guys. They have a lot of data from the bank, how the bank has been performing. So they can use that data to make decisions and so is any other industry here. So algorithmic trading, yeah, this is Forex, um, crypto, literally all that. Uh, you can use leverage data science in that. Uh, the other thing is risk analytics. So risk is a very big thing when it comes to businesses and the aim of all the businesses to minimize risk. So how do you how do you minimize risks? How do you you know predict or get ready for the risks that are you know within your control and outside your control? So risk analytics is something that is really coming up, and we are seeing organization even creating an enterprise risk framework where they map out all the risks, and they are able to incorporate analytics to be able to deal with risks upfront as opposed to when they happen yeah so before they happen they're dealt with yeah so the find the other application here is banking so banking closely related to finance so fraud detection we know with the increase in you know fintech um, there's a lot of fraud maybe credit card fraud and so a lot of fraud, a lot of you know payments are happening online, and fraud detection is a key application of data science. We'll see that down here in an example. 
Um, the other one is credit risk modeling. So this is where maybe the, you know, an example is like the loan scoring. What, how do they know who to give a loan? Yeah. So they basically collect uh, all your loan repayments in the past or, you know, similar data in the past and now they're able to you know give this alone don't give this this person alone and that is actually happening yeah we have banks in kenya doing that yeah the taiwan banks in kenya do that the other thing is um customer lifetime value so in this is something that is applied in marketing specific sales and marketing so they want to know we have you know gotten a customer today so for how long for the the time that customer will continue being our customer, how much, so they calculate how much do we expect to get from this customer, yeah? And all these are intertwined because if I have identified my customer, I have identified the different seg the segments that they belong into. So I, might, I can be able to use various metrics to calculate customer lifetime value, yeah? So this is a concept in marketing and sales. Yeah, so. Any question before we proceed? Am I moving too fast? Okay, I, I hope I'm not moving too fast. Okay. Okay, Dixon, I see you have your hand up. Do you have a question? Okay, all right. Yeah, so um, from our, sorry, I don't know why this keeps going back. Yeah, yeah, so I want us to drill down, or as I had said, we cannot cover everything here. So this is just to help us appreciate and, you know, see what is actually being done out here. Yeah, so this is not a story of what is possible. It is what is actually happening, yeah? And so, therefore, we will move to, I have just identified three use cases. So we'll just go through them and see how organizations are using data science in doing that, yeah? So um, the first one is fraud detection, yeah? So this is because, you know, finance is such a huge user of data, as I said earlier. And we are going to watch a YouTube video. Um, let me just share the video. Um, so this is a video of how Visa is using AI for payment authorization and fraud detection. So I'll start playing the video, but let me know whether you can hear the audio. For 25, For 25 years, years Visa's artificial, Visa's artificial, artificial intelligence, intelligence has been smarter. getting smarter. Okay, all right. For 25, For 25 years, years Visa's artificial, artificial intelligence has been getting smarter. And smarter. And smarter. And smarter. And smarter. To, the to the point where you probably haven't had a transaction declined for suspected fraud, fraud in quite a while. But did you know, every time you use your card, Visa's AI is learning. Every purse you make helps Visa get even better at protecting your next transaction. Visa's AI doesn't know your name or exactly what you bought. It sees activities and patterns to learn what your typical purchase behavior looks like. So that even before you make your first purchase, we can spot suspicious activity. For every attempted purchase, Visa's AI assesses fraud risk so that the bank that issued your card can approve or deny the transaction or send a text asking you to confirm an unusual payment. Let's take a closer look at how it works. Every Visa account has a profile of previous transaction data each time you buy something, the account profile is updated and compared to the spending behavior of more than 3 billion other accounts, making roughly 180 billion annual transactions. This behavior is grouped into clusters and your account could be in hundreds or thousands of these groups. The activity in these clusters helps Visa understand whether a transaction fits a pattern or departs from the norm enough to be flagged as high risk for fraud and possibly declined by the issuer's bank. So, in one week, you could buy a gift for your cousin's wedding, burritos near the office, 
the tattoo you'll later regret. Tickets to a music festival, a return ticket for your business trip to Peru, and hang gliding lessons, so you can jump off a cliff while you're there. And none will be declined. Because even though your week seems unique, there are many others out there who also use their visa accounts to enjoy body art, business travel, and cliff jumping. The more purchases people make, the smarter Visa's AI becomes, ensuring that even your wildest week or very first purchase will make sense to Visa's AI, or doesn't, resulting in fraud detection when you need it and approvals when you want them. In fact, since you started watching this video, Visa's community has helped our AI analyze more than 600,000 transactions for fraud, ensuring that your hang gliding lesson gets off the ground as smoothly as your transaction approval. Sorry, there was some echo. Oh, yes, madam. Sorry, do I replay the video? I uh, see. When you're play when you're replaying the video, you'll have to mute yourself ah. because uh, yeah, that's what's causing the echo. Should I replay the video? Um, and I think people can majority rules. I guess. <laughs> um, I think I'll just share the link. Okay. 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 I, I repeat the video. Thanks, Sanj. Yeah. Okay, sorry about For 25. So let me know if you can hear it. Five years, Visa's artificial intelligence has been getting smarter. And smarter. And smarter to the point where you probably haven't had a transaction declined for suspected fraud in quite a while. But did you know, every time you use your card, Visa's AI is learning. Every purchase you make helps Visa get even better at protecting your next transaction. Visa's AI doesn't know your name or exactly what you bought. It sees activities and patterns to learn what your typical purchase behavior looks like. So that even before you make your first purchase, we can spot suspicious activity. For every attempted purchase, Visa's AI assesses fraud risk so that the bank that issued your card can approve or deny the transaction, or send a text asking you to confirm an unusual payment. Let's take a closer look at how it works. Every Visa account has a profile of previous transaction data. Each time you buy something, the account profile is updated and compared to the spending behavior of more than 3 billion other accounts, making roughly 180 billion annual transactions. This behavior is grouped into clusters, and your account could be in hundreds or thousands of these groups. The activity in these clusters helps Visa understand whether a transaction fits a pattern or departs from the norm enough to be flagged as high risk for fraud and possibly declined by the issuer's bank. So, in one week, you could buy a gift for your cousin's wedding, burritos near the office, the tattoo you'll later regret, tickets to a music festival, a return ticket for your business trip to Peru, and hang gliding lessons, so you can jump off a cliff while you're there. And none will be declined. Because even though your week seems unique, there are many others out there who also use their visa accounts to enjoy body art, business travel, and cliff jumping. The more purchases people make, the smarter Visa's AI becomes, ensuring that even your wildest week or very first purchase will make sense to Visa's AI, or doesn't, resulting in fraud detection when you need it and approvals when you want them. In fact, since you started watching this video, Visa's community has helped our AI analyze more than 600,000 transactions for fraud, ensuring that your hang gliding lesson gets off the ground as smoothly as your transaction approval. Any comments from the video or questions? This is very informative. Good morning, everybody. My name is Dan Donovan. I'm the head of customer Sorry, success and shift technology. Okay, let me continue sharing my previous presentation. Uh, hey, Tess, there was a question uh, yeah. from the previous slide that you shared. So someone oh. asked that is Hamal. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. How do you choose the sector that best suits your skills? I don't know if okay. you can see the question. 
Oh, sorry, I didn't kindly flag them for me next time, yeah? So how do you choose the sector that best suits your skills, yeah? So I think when you talk about the technical skills, the data skills, you can literally fit into any, you know, industry. And I say that because, as I had mentioned earlier, there are people with domain knowledge on whatever it is that you're going to be doing, yeah? For instance, as a software engineer, you can work in a bank, you can work in a hospital, you can work in sales in a in a sales company you can work literally anywhere yeah so you really don't have to choose but you know when you're presented with opportunities only two conflicting opportunities go with what you're most interested in yeah so if you're just if you're a data scientist you can you know work in any industry it will take you like a couple of months to pick up you know the domain knowledge yeah so as a consultant myself i work with clients in banking hospitals airlines and you see there are different sectors completely but my skills since still apply when i sit down with them you know a couple of weeks and understand exactly what they need to do yeah so there really isn't a best sector per se yeah so that's that's the response i hope it is sufficient um okay i continue sharing Okay, so that was um, fraud, fraud detection. I hope you have appreciated, you know, how that goes about. And if you think, uh, if you go back to this, to this um, approach or data science life cycle, you can look at it from a business perspective, yeah? So what is your main goal? To reduce the number of fraudulent transactions going through because you know people are using other people's cards to do transactions and that's not good yeah so that's not good for their business so maybe someone sat down there are many frauds occurring people are reporting a lot of fraud that was a problem they sat down with business and understood why exactly is this happening is this within our goal yeah we need to prevent fraud so where's the data going to come from previous transactions so how does this data look like they did a feature engineering trained a model you know, at the end of the day, you know, they have a dashboard, maybe, I don't know, I've never been there, a dashboard that shows, yeah, you know, today we have 50, 50,000 or 50 cases of fraud, fraudulent transactions that have gone through. So how do we improve our model to flat, not to, you know, for them not to bypass the model, yeah? So something of that sort. So look at it from a business side and things will all make sense. So the next, so the ad benefits that video has articulated, fast and efficient detection. You have seen the number of transactions that are being flagged by the minute. Um, accuracy, definitely, you, you will find that with machine learning, you're able to, you know, flag a bit more and more being more accurate. You reduce the number of false positives. Uh, definitely better prediction, cost effective, because you really don't have someone going through every transaction manually to check. Better classification on what is a fraud, fraud, fraudulent transaction and what is not. And definitely it is easily scalable. So when you deploy to the cloud, it's easily scalable because you just need to increase the number of maybe provisioning that you have done. So here, so the links, um, so if you need to practice or, you know, do more practice on your own, maybe you don't work for an organization that does this and you need to polish up your skills. There are a couple of links here from Kaggle. So Kaggle competitions. Um, I'll share this presentation, but I can, we can just go through one and just look at it and see, yeah. So I'll have to reshare my screen. presenting so we'll look at the data sample data mm. yeah so here it is um credit cards fraud detection competition so if you haven't you interacted with Kaggle before you know how this goes but if you haven't um this is um, so Kaggle hosts competitions and 
so the main thing here is the the data yeah so we have data um we have trained data so let us look at the data i don't know if i can see the data when i haven't logged in let me just log in minute Uh, so, oh, I, know, I, did, I had not accepted the terms, okay. So this is a sample of how the data looks like. Um, so this data is posted by different people, even yourself, you can upload data. This doesn't seem so descriptive, but you can see the different uh, columns here. So what you do is what you do in at cargo, yeah, we don't have correct like right um uh what column names. What you do in cargo, you can just download the data set, do your own exploration and ask yourself questions and answer them using the data. Yeah. So this doesn't have much interactions, but um I think the other links have, yeah. So you get a couple of you know, data sets, ask yourself questions and try to answer them. So, and I would I encourage us to be going through um, the, you know, the, the cycle that I shared earlier. So I'll share the, the links, the links to the... I'll share the links to the Kaggle competition so, yeah. So yeah, so you can do that. So the other application is Recommender Systems. I chose this because we all have interacted with, you know, Spotify. You might have bought something on Amazon, Netflix, and I, I had mentioned this earlier on the previous slide. So a Recommender System is basically an intelligent salesperson, you know, and they recommend things to you based on a number of factors. And one factor can be, as I had said earlier, someone who bought this also bought this, yeah? So this that is basically it from a high level perspective. You know, when you want to get the technical details, um, you can go in here, um, the Kaggle competitions. I won't uh, open the links again and just see um, the different data sets that are available to help you with uh, recommendations. And they don't have to be, you know, e-commerce e or music or movies. They can be Airbnbs, yeah, for example. We have like Expedia hotel recommendations here and Airbnb hotel recommendations. Yeah, so please remember to follow this process every time you're placed with a problem. Whether you're doing a toy project, whether you know, you're know you doing something at work, remember to follow this, um, this approach. Remember, don't never build a model without visualizing the output of your model, yeah? You're too technical and in real life, no one really cares about those technical details. They want to see numbers and things in business terms. Uh, the final one I had said, said I had chosen three is customer analytics. Customer analytics is a very key, you know, is a very key thing because for most um, B two C uh, businesses, that is business to consumer like Safaricom, banks do both B two B and B two C. Even Safaricom both do does both. So customer analytics specifically, mostly, is for B to C because you have you know a huge you know um, repository of customers and you want to see how all these customers are interacting with your brand. Yeah, so customer analytics includes a lot of you know customer segmentation. Um, even the recommendation bit can be part of customer analytics because you analyze you recommend based on the analytics you did on the consumer. Yeah, so. And the point of that is to gain a deeper understanding on how people interact with your brand for you to be able to see whether you will cross-sell. You know, cross-selling is you, someone has bought this, can they also buy something else, yeah? So, and that will increase your business, you know, um, profits or revenues at the end of the day. 
So this is, you can, you, you, when you talk about customer analytics, most of the time, you know, some sales and marketing terms comes in here, the customer lifetime value, because these are the people that, you know, deal with customers and they're the ones that drive business development. So customer analytics, oh, source of the slide somewhere on the internet. So marketing and advertising, um, customer service. So it's all about, you know, customer analytics, retention, loyalty, and definitely improving the customer experience. So my customer experience, we can look at even Apple. You know, their design is very intuitive, very good. So they use a lot of analytics to do that, yeah. Uh, so something else that is not on, we have competition, something else that is not on these slides, but maybe it's good to mention is something like HR analytics. I have noticed she's not anywhere here, but it is very key for HR, people in HR, because, you know, we have a lot of customer data, I mean, uh, employee data. When you get hired, people ask for everything, you know, your your details, your everything. And not to say that they should abuse that data, but they can use a lot of data to predict employee churn rate, you know, how, which employees likely to leave, um, you know, different evaluate performance, uh, employee performance. And with that, you know, as we move to the, we are in the digital world already, um, we can leverage on literally any, any piece of data you have to, you know, to make, better business decision. So I don't know if there's anyone with a question. Yes, someone has raised their hand. Yes, Naftal. Oh, okay. Uh, so, sorry, sorry, sir. Sorry, madam. No, I've just been so, no problem. Okay. So any question? So that is actually the end. It was meant to be a brief one. So any question before I give my parting shot? Or yeah, any question? Hi, Tessie. Hi. Just want to thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is, is is slightly off the topic of the presentation because it was already well done and I think you explained it really well. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask, uh, so this this uh, YouTube uh, will be placed on YouTube under which link? That's the thing I would like to ask. The video I had shared. Uh, no, no, no. The, mm -hmm. the, 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 the 25 recording. years. The, the what, sorry? The recording in, in, in general. Oh, this recording. Yes. Yeah, it will be shared by the Lux team. Okay, okay. I think anyone who had registered will receive an email. Okay. Yes, yes. All right, thank you so much. All right. And they, I'll share with them the, the slides because they're not proprietary in any way. So, yeah, I'll just share the slides as well. Thank you. All right. Any other question? Hi, Jesse. Hi, Jesse. Um, I would like to ask um, for anyone who has done some programming, some codes before, mm -hmm. or who is a recent graduate of from um, of software engineering from mm -hmm. software engineering field. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. like, when it comes to applying the jobs, so how do you address that as a software as a data scientist? Because at the end, will they not require you to have some specialties in data science mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you can just apply direct as a software engineer using i mean the name of data science with your own transcripts from the university okay so you're from uni you have done software engineering and would like to apply to data science related jobs yeah 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 okay so in my opinion this is very opinionated I think um, when you know software engineering, you actually you know do better as a data scientist. Reason being, um, as we know, this industry is quite new compared to other industries, the data science world, and different companies have different definitions of what it is. If you go online today to look for job descriptions of data scientists, you'll find literally everything. Yeah, 
I've had people say, oh, I am a data scientist, but I work as a senior software engineer. Yeah. So what you can do is look, software engineering has so many aspects. And when you look at something like Python as a tool, I call it a tool, uh, Python is, you know, greatly used in um, data science. So you can, you know, sharpen your skills in terms of the skills that are directly applicable to data science. SQL is like a lingua franca for data. No, let no one lie to you that, you know, you're going to deploy these fancy machine learning models all the time. Yeah, so you can align your skills in a way that, you know, Python, yeah, Python for software development and also Python for data science. Yeah, so you can align yourself in that direction. And actually, you no one really expects much from you in terms of skill set when you're direct from school from school yeah so they'll be willing to you know teach you and help you understand a lot of things okay thank you right um any other question okay all right so let me just stop sharing my screen. And so my parting shot. Yes, Derek. Hi. Okay. Um, just to say a lot of the presentation and yeah, I've covered a lot. Thanks. All right, great. Thank you for the feedback. Okay. So my parting shot for today, it's not like something big, but um, I would like to, you know, want us to you know in tech we tend to focus more on the technical bit and forget the business relevance of things yeah and for example if you are talking to a manager in a business they don't know python they don't know hadoop they don't know all those things you're talking about they want to know how does the skill you have help my business yeah so as we pitch ourselves as we talk to employers as we do our interviews let us remember to lean on the business side and explain things from the business side and how our technical skills will help us, um, you know, solve business problems. Yeah. So yeah, that is my parting shot. And thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me. And I look forward to interacting with all of you within the social media space. So yeah, thank you so much. I'll hand it over to the last team to close. Okay, hi Tess, uh, that was impressive. Uh, it was very informative. Uh, I hope everyone has learned something new that they will practice in their process or in their career uh, path, becoming a data scientist or any field in data science. Like uh, you can apply it also in machine, data engineering, machine learning, anything that you feel you are interested in. Uh, okay, maybe, I don't know if there is someone with a question that was unanswered or they would like to share, but I can see someone is asking for your contact, maybe a social oh. media link, but you can share maybe a Twitter or LinkedIn, anything that you're, yes, you feel comfortable me, sharing. Let me share my LinkedIn. Um, I don't have, I have not logged in on Twitter on this machine, so I think I can share my username. Just a minute. Mm. Uh, let me share your Twitter. Oh, you, you have it? Oh. I already have it, yeah. So I think I'll share it. Yeah, that's my LinkedIn. And this is your Twitter. Mm. Okay. And so, uh, hmm, there is a question. Maybe some of us uh, of the ups and downs that you're faced in your uh, in the area of data. Oh yeah, a lot. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> one thing is, as a um, a new person in the industry, yeah. When I say new person, because I joined two years, actually September twenty nineteen. That's when I graduated, and one key challenge is imposter syndrome you know you really don't know what whether what you know is is good enough to make you stand out yeah and someone yesterday in a talk said there's a difference between imposter syndrome and incompetence yeah and there's a very thin line there yeah so i think well, the the 
the ups, the downs, the downs are is that imposter syndrome and also feeling like you're asking too many questions. Yeah, you know, when you're new in anything and there are people who've been there 10 years, there's a lot of questions to ask. So sometimes you feel like you're asking too many questions or things are getting too technical and you're not understanding or things are getting too businessy and you're technical, you're a technical person. Yeah, so that's a challenge. But how I have handled that is to keep myself in check, you know. Is it really imposter syndrome? Is it that I am incompetent? So, you know, you really need to put yourself in check and know what exactly you're experiencing. And the other thing is whenever you feel like you're asking too many questions, don't stop. Because the moment you stop asking questions, I really don't know whether you'll be of any, you know, importance to anyone. And the other thing is being a consultant, that means I am working on different clients on different projects. And as I said earlier, clients are from different industries. Today you're working with an airline, tomorrow you're working with a telco. And they have very many business processes. And it is, you know, it is very hard to understand. Some things don't even make sense to you. So that has been a challenge. But as you move along, as you proceed along, you get context of things and things get a little bit bearable let me not say easier a little bit bearable i hope i've answered your question um Deshana, you know? yeah uh okay uh, and maybe to ask which are the common tools that you, you usually use most of the times the common tools like yes. programming languages oh. yeah. Actually, my primary tools are Python, SQL, Al, um, Altrix. There's Altrix for, so I use Altrix. Altrix, I'm not sure whether, Alt, Alta YX, some people have heard of that. Altrix, I use Power BI for visualization and also Python for visualization. But there are some clients who prefer you know, Power BI, Tableau. So you really have to use what the client wants. Yeah, those are my primary tools. And Excel, oh my God, I use Excel a lot. So ex don't, but they don't, don't. When you go to, when you work with finance clients, you do a lot of Excel. Um, another question from Daisy. Could you speak uh, on the work-life balance as a data scientist? Um, hmm. Let me just say as a professional in the industry, Work-life balance, um, am I the best person to speak about this? Work-life balance is some a very subjective topic, to so to speak, yeah? Yeah, there's some people who are like, I work from eight to five, after five, don't call me. But there's some times you really have to go above and beyond and deliver. Um, or work more hours than expected. Other times you really don't have anything to do. But what I have learned to do is compartmentalization in my head. Yeah, you know, sometimes you're carried by work all the time you're working or when even you're not working, you're thinking about work. So be being very intentional about whatever you're doing. And, you know, sometimes you just maybe overwhelmed, you have done your best. You just know where to know where the boundary is. Yeah. So know where the boundary is and just be aware of yourself. I have not mastered that yet, so we are still there. Um, what actually qualifies you to venture into data science? So to venture into as a beginner, I really think just a basic understanding of the different data science tools and libraries uh, really matters, yeah? Because maybe you, as an entry level person, you're going in as a technical person. Uh, but as you proceed, you realize that having domain knowledge is important. Business knowledge is very important. So there's no there's not a checklist of exactly what you need to know. But it's good to know the you know the tools. I call them tools. I'm not saying Python. They're Python R whatever. The tools for data science. You know basic um, knowledge of that, and also understand the business and be willing to learn. Um, I hope I've answered your question. Um, wisely, let's on. Um, then Hussein, kindly share with us salaries of, salaries of data scientists in Kenya. So you see, there are different employers for data scientists around. There are 
finance firms, banks, telcos, startups. So I think the pay range is not on the, you know, when you talk about like doctors, maybe they are paid a certain band range, yeah? But when you talk about data scientists, literally every industry has a data scientist. So the, I might not speak much to the range, but it depends on the organization that you're working. Because you find organizations don't even really recognize a data scientist, they, just like any other employee. So if you're in this grade, you're paid that grade, you know, regardless of whether you're a data scientist or not. Um, I hope I've answered your question, Hussein. Um, there's another question from Thomas on tools, which is the most preferred tool in the market? Uh, in my opinion and in my experience, Python, SQL. That is very opinionated, Python and SQL. Yeah, so especially SQL. Yeah, so I saw a post on LinkedIn. I, I don't know whether I can trace it now. Someone had done around 2,800 interviews and they were giving us their, you know, the lessons they learned. And SQL is, yeah, SQL is, is bay. <laughs> yeah. Any other question? What about R? So R is used, yeah. But for, I've seen R being used by healthcare clients or people that are intensive on statistics. So let me say just healthcare, yeah. But R is also good, yeah. People use R a lot. Or people who have those SPSS, SPSS people who use that, or people who have legacy systems, they prefer to use R, yeah. So, but I am a proponent of Python, not like I get paid for it, but yeah, Python is also good. And R, R depends on, if a client comes today and they want me to use R, they have an option. I have to, to learn R. It's just a tool, yeah, to achieve the goal. All right. Thank you, Hussein, for that. Um, any other question? We have, like, a few minutes because I'm looking for the link that, let me get the link that talked about that. Any other comment or question before we close? And maybe to ask that, uh, maybe my question is, uh, which is your pref like your most interesting uh, step or stage in your whole data science workflow? My most interesting stage? Do you yes. Mean? Okay. Um, just a minute, let me send the link. Let me just send it. My Sorry. Are you said my most my most what? Like, uh, which stage do you enjoy most it's in your good. data science process? Um, I think sometimes I tend to think I'm more of a business analyst than a, a data scientist because I enjoy, you see, the first stage of, um, in my presentation, talking to people, understanding the problem. I think I'm the person who sits between the technical team know the people who, who don't care about those business things they just want to implement and um, now the business people who don't care about the technical bit they just want to their problem solved yeah so my most and you know I, I like talking to people so you can yeah you can tell so talking to customers sitting with them understanding you know what exactly they want why they want it and now translating that into technical terms that is my most enjoyable bit. Not that I don't like the implementing bit, but I tend to do better on the on the translating bit of it. Um, uh, okay, that was the last question that I have. Any freelancing area for data scientists? Any freelancing areas for data scientists? Um, I might not speak much to that. Um, 
but I've had in the WhatsApp group, I mean, I've had people saying, if you're available for three months for a data gig to do this, build a data warehouse for someone, a data lake for someone. So most of the things might not be predictive, but you know, the data acquisition bit, yeah, building data pipelines for them, um, doing some analysis and visualizations. Yeah, so those are the areas I've seen a lot. So when I send the slide, you will see where this comes in. So the acquisition bit and the visualization bit, that is where I've seen most people contract on. Um, uh, okay, do you have anything else that you'd like to share maybe? Mm -hmm. um, let me the link to the groups. Oh, the WhatsApp groups. Um, okay, I'll share with the Lux team. I, I'm not the admin for those groups, but I'll share some links. Um, yeah, we have Daniel. Could you share yeah, quite a bit on the data science interview process from your past experiences? Yeah, so um, I have interviewed for different roles. Some within, well, I'm still working. Don't go tell my employer that I, I interview for other roles. Yeah, so I have challenged myself, yeah. Maybe I go on, on LinkedIn, I see some jobs. Maybe I'm not even interested, but I just want to go through the interview process. And they it depends on where you're interviewing from. If you're interviewing locally, they are, there's a different methodology on how they do it. But if you're interviewing for international companies, the process is pretty standardized, so to speak. You do the, you know, the screening maybe the the fun companies replace f with m those big companies the the screening you do a technical interviews you can do um what do we call it that visual boarding sort of interview but what has stood out really is the type of questions they ask here yeah? they ask you they don't ask you how do you how do you do a join for example no they ask you for example I mean, you know, this department, I want to see how many customers, how many new customers per month I have. So for you to translate that into technical, that is SQL or Python or whichever language you want to use and answer that question. So the questions are a bit, they're technical, but they have a business side to it, as I said earlier. Yeah? So I have interviewed for business analyst roles uh, for data science they tend to be quite technical because you have to understand algorithms i have a friend who interviewed for such a role so they ask about algorithms so basically it's a borderline between software engineering and data you yeah? know so for, for huge companies the other companies where you just want to be an analyst they will ask you about visualizations whether you know how to use power bi tableau where you know sql whether you know excel yeah so the experience has been varying. I have, I have not gotten most of the jobs I interviewed for, but I, I make sure to challenge myself. At least per month, I interview for one job, whether I'm going to take it or not. So to just keep myself up to date with what is happening. And my friends do that as well. So it's a thing we do. Yeah. Any other question? Okay, so okay. thank you. I can see that there are no more questions from the audience. Yeah. Maybe someone want to ask verbally. Do you want to unmute your mic and ask a question? Okay, uh, if you don't have, maybe you can give us your part short, like a quote, anything that keeps you motivated, books like you read, how you get your resource, learning resources, and maybe the type of movie that you're watching. To see. Isn't that you think of your to share? Okay, so what keeps me motivated? I don't know. I'm I'm a very turbulent person. So yeah, sometimes I do nothing at all. Other times I do everything in a day. So I'm not the best to advise on routines and everything. Um when in terms of learning resources, so my employer has free subscription to LinkedIn Learning and Udemy. But outside of that, I do watch YouTube videos. I use Kaggle for practicing. Um, 
what else do I do? Yeah, that's that. A movie I'm watching. I'm watching, what do we call it? There's this thing about F1 drivers on Netflix. That one. Um, someone recommended that I watch that one so that I become a fan of F1. So I hope I'll be one in a few weeks. Um, there's a question from Dixon. Oh, that's it. There's a question from Dixon. What can a beginner do to reach others outside there? That's a very good question. So there are this LinkedIn. People comment. If you're active on LinkedIn, you see people commenting all the time. And they comment with links to resources, links to meetups. So Twitter, take Twitter, but I prefer LinkedIn. People are more serious there. Uh, LinkedIn, and you can also join tech communities like um, Lux Academy. Um, they have a community. So with that, you can get links to such talks. Alternatively, you can join mailing listings for people who write about data science. You know, they get a, you get a lot of resources, but primary LinkedIn and tech communities. Okay. okay, nice. So, do you have anything to share? For myself, no, I don't have anything else to share. Okay. Thank you so From much. the audience, do you have anything else? Uh, one, uh, I think uh, if anyone has a question, then they will get in touch with you. I think you shared your LinkedIn link uh, earlier and your, your Twitter handle. So, yeah, you have really enjoyed. Thank you for your time. You'll be recording the call and share it on YouTube and share the link uh, through our different social media platform. Uh, yeah. So feel free to check Data Science Africa on Twitter. That is where you share the link and also have shared the link for Data Science Africa. I want also to share for Lux Academy. Let me see if I can get it. Yeah, it is yeah, Lux Academy. Yeah, and if you are ready and you want to engage with other ladies in community, you can check release of Lux. Uh, it is a community by Lux Academy. Uh, yes, that helps other ladies, beings ladies together to learn and to grow together. So thank you everyone. Thank you for your time. Until next time, bye. You can have a great night and those who are in West Africa, they can have a great evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.